right. Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining today's webinar focusing on how Dr. Matt Anise places 300 implants per year as a general practitioner. My name is Adam, Content Marketing Specialist with Henry Shine, and I'll be your moderator. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A section of your control panel, and we'll be sure to cover them at the end of the webinar. Please make sure that your volume is up and any large computer applications are closed to ensure a smooth connection. This webinar is presented by Henry Schein Dental and no CE credits are being offered for viewing this presentation. Our speaker today is Dr. Matt Anise. Thanks for being with us. I'll turn it over to you. All right, awesome. Uh, first of all, I wanna say thanks guys. Um, I know everyone's kind of getting back in the swing of things and pretty zoomed out as I am personally, but um, you're taking the time and we'll jump right in so we don't waste any time. Um, so kind of the topic today, it's kind of my personal journey, um, my mistakes, things that have worked in my practice that's allowed me to grow to you know, place a little bit over 300 implants per year um, as a general practice. Um, we're not going to go deep into implant 101. It's not going to be, you know, after today, you can place an implant tomorrow. We're going to touch the surface on a bunch of um, topics, you know, between implant placement, technology, and marketing, and team. Um, we're going to talk about my journey, how I got started, um, and then if you're just starting to go down the path, some steps to take, or if you're on the path, just kind of stuck doing single tooth implants, you know, what the next steps would be to, to grow implants into your general practice. Um, we're going to touch base on in, uh, equipment, tools, and you know, what do you really need? You know, every sales rep, I know this is a Henry Schein sponsored webinar, but you know, what do you need to you know, start placing implants? What do you need to really grow um, you know, your, your implant journey? Uh, the ROI of dental implants, you know, how to market dental implants, some things that you can take home. Um, like I said, you're spending your time here with me. I want to make sure you get value out of it. Even if it's one pearl, one thing that you can bring to your practice, that can make the world of a difference. This isn't, you know, implants isn't an instant fix. It's not an immediate gratification. It's a slow, slow burn and grind. But in, as you'll see with my journey, in the end, it does pay off. And lastly, most importantly, questions and answers. Um, like I said, we're not going too deep in a lot of things. But I want to make sure that any answers, um, any questions that you guys do have, I can at least give my input. Or if I don't know the answers, can steer you in the right direction. So you do get some value out of you know, this next 45 minutes to an hour tonight. So who am I? Um, I own two general practices in the suburbs of Boston. Closing on a third, actually um, trying to merge a practice and set up an independent surgical suite. Uh, graduated BU in 2012 and you know, eight years ago. I placed zero implants. I took one open tray impression and then one closed tray impression on a laptop model. So that was my experience. I know now schools are um, really focused on implants for pre-dents, but I had none. Um, after graduation, I did work in a community health center in Boston. I put an arrow there because that's key and we'll touch, points on, touch point on that later. Uh, then I made the slow transition to private practice. Um, I realized that seeing three patients in a private practice setting was a lot more profitable and a lot more better for my overall health than seeing 40 patients and getting paid like a hygienist. Um, you know, I purchased my first practice in 2017, uh, the second one uh, shortly thereafter in 2018. And my goal currently, I'm focusing on transitioning to you know, sedation, implant, and complex comprehensive care try to minimize single tooth dentistry as much as possible. Um, but an important thing, it's why, you know, why, why are you here? Why are you spending the time? Why are you trying to learn about implants and how to grow implants? Um, I'll get to my why, um, but it's, is it because that it's what everyone's doing and it looks cool on social media and look at all these, you know, pants with all these implants and crazy surgery videos. But I can tell you that, you know, my Instagram's filled with these beautiful smile makeovers from APA, but in the last you know, year or two, I think I've done 10 total veneers. Because that you know, is my why, that's not the way I practice, that's not the way I treat and plan. So it's you know, really important you know, to start with, you know, why are you here, why implants, and figure out what the path is to get to your ultimate goal. So I, I truly believe in that. And this is an awesome author. His YouTube videos are phenomenal. So I do recommend with that. 
So my why was I had the surgical foundation with extractions, socket preservation, and the next logical step was implants. Um, we'll touch base on that, how I got my foundation. But an important control, uh, I had no control of the surgical phase. I'll show you some examples next slide. And I was stuck with whatever you know, prosthetic that I could finagle based on where the surgeon placed the implants. And I had no control in the process and that's just did not sit well with me. Um, also, I wanted to add to my clinical repertoire and do more surgery. Um, just grow clinically, grow as a dentist, grow as a clinician, just a natural progression. But, and I also wanted to offer patient solutions in a single setting. Um, you know, communication between specialists is sometimes fantastic, but it's also sometimes not. Things get lost in translation, things aren't done up to your standards. And I wanted to kind of eliminate that and give patients more of a reason to say yes, because you'll also give referrals. And then they come back three, six months later, and, oh yeah, I lost that piece of paper, I'm not going, I don't feel like driving <laughs> 10 minutes down the road to get quality care. For whatever reason, you know, that's what we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So again, here are some examples. These are x-rays from a specialist that I had to restore when I was an associate. Um, as you can imagine, um, it was fun. And guess who got blamed when the crowns didn't feel right? You know, the implants felt fine, but you know, it was my fault because the crowns, you know, sucked, which any clinician could know would be further from the truth. So how I started down this path, um, like I said, I started in the community health center. It was a free care, low income um, place right outside of Boston in a really underserved population. By the time I finished up there two and a half, three years later, I had well over 20,000 extractions. Um, you know, I taught you know, tough students, fourth years, uh, BU, fourth year students, Lutheran residency. So I had the, I could take out any tooth um, by up to that point. So it was the next logical step. How do I preserve the socket? And these people really couldn't pay for um, you know, implants. So it was, and I knew going to private, if I took out a tooth, I should learn how to at least preserve and, you know, set up to replace the tooth or actually replace the tooth myself. And um, on the previous slide, I think it was the one on the left, that implant was actually placed in like the lingual fossa. It wasn't in any bone whatsoever. It was in the soft tissue. Um, I booked my trip to Mexico um, that day, and I left a few weeks later for a week. Uh, up until that point, I took countless CE didactically. Uh, I took courses on how to restore, place, everything. Um, and also, one of the top implant lecturers, Paul Vugazato, was in the next town over. You know, I would go to his CE courses and go to his study clubs, and I was just really drawn to implants. But you can read the clinical operative dentistry textbook, but your first MO. It, I still remember how terrible it was. I just needed the reps. I needed the clinical experience. So I hopped on the plane and, you know, a week later I came back and I came back and I selectively chose, you know, single posterior heel sites, uh, no anatomical considerations and plenty of space. And that is a perfect way to start. Um, you know, that's, it's going to be a lot about case selection when you do start, or if you've already started, this is kind of redundant, but I know there's a lot of you here today, um, just kind of cover, a whole range of experience. But that case selection gave me the confidence to progress to multiple implants. You know, interior implants, which they don't want to mess up because it's not fun to rectify. Immediate implants uh, to where I am today. Um, typically, we're doing full arch, immediate load implants. Um, typically, three, four hours, we're taking out teeth, placing implants, and loading a temporary provisional. Um, you know, here are some pans of the cases that we do. Some guided, some freehand, and mostly guided when we can. Um, but it's, you know, from single tooth implants five, six years ago to this. So, I mean, there is a journey, there is a progression. I didn't come out doing this sort of work, but, you know, all these steps that we're gonna kind of talk about today has helped me on my journey to get there. So should I start placing implants if you haven't? Um, I think without a doubt, 
start the journey with the education. Um, you know, there's many great courses today. When I started six years ago, there was maybe two. I know Garg was one of them that I mentioned there. But it's the YouTube with the Facebook groups with, there's so many within the continental United States, um, with Implant Pathways in Arizona. They're gonna take it beyond the didactic. The didactic, it's there, but clinical reps is what's really important. And know, having someone to be there and know how to fix a mistake is crucial. Um, but even if you decide you hate surgery, you hate taking out teeth, it's not for you. I never wanna place an implant. I wanna sit there and just restore them. But you gain the foundation for case selection for your specialists. You know, have a great relationship. Be able to talk at their level so you're not expecting below your standard of care. Um, it's really important in that it's not the bone that sets the tone, you know, that's gone well far away. You should be the quarterback. You should be, I'm telling you what to do, what I expect and how do I restore. And then if you have that confidence, you'd be surprised that they have patients going to them asking for these services without a restorative dentist. So you do gain that symbiotic relationship and you're going to find yourself doing less posterior bridges. Um, you know, I maybe do, if I have one, two a year, personally, um, you know, I personally believe that I like to keep a single tooth problem, a single tooth solution, um, unless it's part of a larger, you know, arch rehabilitation where we're doing a lot of crown and bridge, then, you know, I will give the option just to get an expedited result. But, you know, typically it's not my first line of treatment planning. And I try to steer patients away from that. Um, it's truly changed my practice, not only financially, um, we'll touch into that, but also more rewardingly. Um, I love <laughs> doing implant dentistry. Uh, if you give me, you know, back-to-back -back MODOs, you're, I'm going to be in a bad mood. My team can attest to that. You give me a single tooth heel ridge implant. That's one of the easiest things you can do in, 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 you know, in dentistry. But if you're going to start, it is a bumpy ride. There's going to be mistakes. There's going to be failures. There's going to be days where you're sweating and you just want to call it quits. Just know that everyone's been through that. It's an expensive wagon to jump off of. And you just realize that in time, those trivial mistakes really are minor. You can handle them with ease with more experience. So what do you need to place implants? Everyone, it's... You hear this all over the board, um, especially with technology today. I'm going to start, I'm going to be a little bit controversial, I would say, but I would say most importantly, the solid foundation. That is the most important thing. That is what got me here today. Um, I could, like I said, if you can, can't can take out any tooth that walks into your practice, start there. Um, that will build your foundation. Um, obviously not some impacted thirds and things that are bony impacted and or they want to go be put to sleep, but have the ability to take out teeth, to manipulate soft tissue, to manipulate a ridge. Um, that is all really important in implant dentistry. It's not just sticking you know, a piece of metal into a piece of bone. You know, now we're seeing how important soft tissue is for the longevity and proper planning and the aesthetic planning. So truly, truly believe that I know everyone wants to jump in and implants are the cool thing to do and everyone's doing them. Start with the simple things. Um, it's, it's in how do you do that? Well, I don't have patients that I can take out teeth. You know, go do mission trips, um, go take courses in, you know, third world countries or underserved populations part of the United States or do free dental days in your practice. Market to the community, talk to them, you know, post it. It's a really good relationship builder in your community and you're offering care to people that need it around your practice. So get that foundation. Um, you know, implants will just be a natural progression. You know, obviously you're gonna need implants, surgical motor, surgical kit, you know, basic instruments. And then the most important thing is proper pre-planning pre that corresponds with case selection. Uh, you notice, I didn't say you need a CBCT, you need a guide, you need a digital scanner, you need a 3D printer. Um, I have all these, we're gonna go through the importance of why I think you should have these, but getting your feet wet or dipping your toes in, I don't think they're absolutely necessary. And um, 
because I started with a pan, a PA, and implants. You know, I was an associate. That was all that was available. I couldn't make decisions. I had no buying power. They, you know, they're basically like, oh, here's a PA. You know, I could barely pick up the sizes or properly plan. But you know, I started with case selection. You know, I avoided any sort of anatomical considerations. The, I stayed away from you know IAN, I, the lingual fossa, the mental foramen. You know, I didn't do many interiors unless it was immediate, and I can tell there was no concavity on the maxilla. On the maxilla. So it's you can start that way. You know, get your first couple of reps, find if it's for you. But you're living in the gray, and it could be considered. You know, you have some liability there. But I strongly suggest, and it probably will become the norm, to utilize today's technology to help advance your career, or to start an implant or to advance it a step further. You know, like I said, we have cone beams in both offices. Uh, we have actually the new Trios 4 got set up today. It's right next to me. Um, we have a Trios 3. We have a Trios and an ITR at the other office. We have the Form Lab Sprinter. Uh, we have the surgical piezo motor. Um, Quality digital photography that does tie into implants. We'll touch base on this. Um, and then the next step for me, I'm still growing. I'm still here learning. I still have mentors. Like I said, 300 implants. It sounds like a lot, but I have friends and colleagues I look up to that are doing much more that are doing these crazy things that I'm trying to move towards as well. So, I mean, I recommend every office have the following. But even if you don't do implants, we're going to touch base on how they affect your general practice and your tooth borne cases in the benefits that that can do in addition to furthering your implant career um, it's going to be the standard of care um, you're better off being on the leading edge with all this technology not necessarily the bleeding edge like i said there's people that i admire that are pushing the boundaries that are doing these crazy things i, I just kind of follow their lead but i'm following their lead and seeing what works i'm not the one doing all of that and investing that because I just don't have the time with two practices, two kids. Uh, it's a busy life. So, uh, so Combi, it was the first big ticket item I purchased. Uh, this is Combi I have. It's the Action X Mind Trium. Um, I bought it two months after you know, spending a pretty penny for the practice. Um, we had a pan. Uh, it just wasn't up to my standards of what I wanted to to do moving forward now that I have the decision-making capabilities. We've taken over 400 scans and we haven't charged the patient unless we're doing the 11 by nine. So getting out of the range of the maxilla and the mandible and getting referred out to be read by a radiologist for pathology. And that's really the only times we pay for itself. And that's supposed to be 10 times over, but it's paid for itself at least 10 times over without ever charging the patient for the scan. Um, it extends so much beyond implantology. It, you know, that person that walks in with pain on tooth number two or three, and you take a PA and it's a sinus and you can't detect, you take a CBCT, you can just see it as clear as day. Um, you can find the latent endodontic lesions. Um, it's huge, to, uh, you can communicate that and show the patients and show the mucositis and the sinus, and then show the correlation between you know, the bacteria found in those lesions and the higher risk of an ischemic event and the risk of heart attack. And do you really want that in your mouth if that's gonna short, possibly shorten your overall lifespan? So these communications are a lot easier to have and show instead of on a 2D X-ray. Um, if you do do endo in your office, you, you know, number three, number 14, you're looking for the MP2, you can map it relatively easily. Or the new patient comes in and you go and you take a you look at the sagittal plane and then right, you just see the airway completely shut off. That's an easy, hey, you, your airway is completely restricted. Let's get, you know, an HST or let's refer you to a sleep center to evaluate for sleep apnea. So all these things, again, didn't really mention much of implants, but it does help significantly in implantology. You know, we have protocols that every new patient has a comedy. You know, 99% of my implants are placed with the CBCT scan prior. Um, I'm not going to say 100% because, you know, sometimes there's an immediate molar and I just see gorgeous septal bone and I took up the tooth and I know the anatomy, you know, and I can place it immediate. But 
99% of implants are placed with a CBCT scan in the office. And like I said, it can be argued and you can be held liable that placement without it is below the standard of care. I started this journey, but you know, again, it was six years ago. Um, you know, the cost of cone beams have come down tremendously in that matter of time. So I think for the cost of what used to be a PAM um, five, 10 years ago, um, it should be in every office. And then for implants, you, know, you can, it allows for fully guided care. Um, and you get in there and you take a PA and you look, that ridge is easy. And that patient comes in and you open up the flap and then you realize I can't, like, you just suture back up and send them on their way. And then you look bad and makes the patients have less confidence with you. It diagnoses more, but it also saves you time on things that you thought you could do. And so you have two hours of chair time that you've had no production for. So it saves in that sense too, that you know exactly what you're getting into. So that was the first thing I purchased. The next thing was a digital impression system. Uh, that's the Trios 4. I have one right next to me. Uh, I've had the Trios for three years. Um, but we're starting to move towards every new patient gets a digital scan. Again, away from the implants, more into your everyday practice. I think they will be part of the patient record. Um, you don't have to keep those stone models for seven years here in Massachusetts, but you can, it's going to be part and you can show the where, you can show the changes. And I think that's going to be within the short future, part of the digital record. So you might as well jump on board with the other benefits too. Um, in all those cases that you saw, all those, the restorative phase we've done digitally. I can count on my hand the amount of traditional or VPS impressions the last three years. I actually had to take one on my mother-in-law last week. That was like the first one in probably a year and a half, just because the floor of the mouth was above the ridge and it was saliva pooling and couldn't keep it dry. So, but it's full arch. I know people say it's not completely accurate. Um, it's not there yet. It just with my workflow, my lab, what we do, I haven't seen that, but I know that isn't typically the norm. Um, but with patients, you show the malocclusion, you can show the anterior crowding, uh, you can show potential treatment, what it looks like before and after. Um, you can also measure the amount of tooth wear. Um, if they're grinding, you know, as it wears down, you're showing the decrease in the VDO. Um, you can also show possible outcomes like we mentioned. There's so many things and it's you know, technology driven. So it's ever adapting as technology gets better. You know, in, oops, sorry. And in implants, it helps facilitate guides. So we're doing crown down implantology. Anatomy permitting, of course. Um, and all the prosthetics are screw retained. Um, implants are prosthetically driven and not the other way around. <laughs> and that's how I practice. And that's how you know, everything goes from crown down, it shouldn't go based on the bone if there's good you know, anatomy there to support an implant. So another thing that we have um, for your general practice, you, you can print your models and wax up in hours. Uh, the next day, someone comes in for a consult looking for an aesthetic. Rehab, you don't have to send impressions to a lab, wait two weeks, pay the lab bill. You can do a lot of this with a lot of free um, open source softwares. Uh, there's a lot of courses on that. We're not really going to touch base too deep on that, but you know, we do a lot of scans. Um, we also do the marketing where we go to the local high schools and we print the uh, digital scans and make um, inclusive um, athletic mouth guards for the local high school sports teams, which has been a huge practice builder. Uh, minor ortho movements. You don't want to pay the $350, $400 lab bill. Um, you can sit there and there's online, you know, platforms like Blue Sky or, you know, Lab Pronto where, you know, for, you know, 60, 70 bucks, they can move the teeth and then you print the trays and do suck downs and you can control it right in your office. <clears throat> um, and then we make every patient a night guard. Um, we scan, print and print the night guards. Again, we're not, the lab cost is maybe $2 versus, you know, the typical Gladwell hundred dollar, you know, hard soft. And then it allows for surgical guide printing and planning with the digital impression system. Yeah, you know, we make the guides in house for a couple of hours and it costs a couple of dollars and it's good. I mean, labs do great jobs too, but you can do all of this and get it done the next day or two days versus again, the turnaround with labs. Labs are great. 
use. I'm not saying don't use them, but if you have the capability of taking your own hands, it's so much better and you have that control. And then one thing I stand by, every interior implant I place is guided. I've placed them without the guide. It just, I'd rather be spot on because when you do have something go awry, if you think it's easy, you're doing an immediate in the socket and it kicks. It just, it's a something you would rather have and spend the money even if you don't have the printer, just for the, you know the outcome and the patient knows the outcome going forward. So this is a little bit something that I use. It's going to be more if you're already doing implants and you want to take the next step into a little bit more complex surgery. It's an awesome tool um, to aid in a lot of you know, good surgery and bone handling. Also for atraumatic extractions. Um, huge proponent in atraumatic extractions. Every extraction that you do should be, you shouldn't lay a buckle flap, you should never chop bone. Um, like I said, I'm you know, well over 20,000 in, and the only time I lay a buckle flap is when I do third molars that are you know, horizontally impacted. That's it. Um, it should be atraumatic. They can make things that cut the PDL and the teeth pop right out. But also it gives the bone reduction. Um, a lot of these cases we're doing FP3 prostheses. So we need to hide the transition zone. You know, the way it cuts, it, it's less splatter, less you know, blood going everywhere because these do get a little bit messy. It's less swelling, less healing time. Uh, so it's really helped you know, harness bone precisely. Uh, it's well controlled, um, it cuts really well. So again, like, you're doing the step from just single site surgery, posterior healed sites, and the next step in getting into a little bit more complex you know, piezos for handling the bone and doing all these surgeries, bridge splitting, harvesting, APOs, um, lateral windows, sinus lifts, hydraulic lifts with the water. They can do all that. Uh, <clears throat> like I said, it added to my repertoire once I had the surgical foundation in you know, basic implantology. And the most important thing, um, I can't stress this, you'll hear 900 courses stress this. There's, you know, the whole facially generated treatment planning, you know, focuses on this. It's photography. It's been by far one of the biggest game changers um, in my office. <clears throat> it allows you to treatment plan and co-diagnose with the patient. And that is a lot easier to do in pictures than in you know, shades of black and white x-rays. You know, trying to explain, uh, showing a tilt on a bite wing that the next bite wing from last year is on the same angle as so you can't see the movement. Um, you can show the super eruption, the tilting, the excessive wear due to lack of posterior support. Um, and then even if they're too far gone, take pictures on those patients and then show the patients that you know, just have the tooth attracted. And like, oh, I don't know if I want to replace it. I can eat fine. Show them, you know, what this could turn into. It's going to be a motivating factor that they can visualize and see, hey, if this isn't something that we could potentially get on quicker, here's a potential negative outcome that is going to be a lot more to address later. Is that something you're willing to risk? These are the conversations that if you just visualize the patient and allow them to see the possible outcomes, um, it gets them motivated to do treatment versus words and x-rays that they really don't understand. You know, the vernacular that we use and super eruption and it just goes right over their head. But pictures, you know, make a lasting impression. Uh, it helps with communication in the lab with proper planning. You know, show, it's show before and after of what's possible. You can do these, these great tools now that you take a picture of their smile before, throw you know some new smile on, and show them what they could look like in your with your care. And then also, I mean, sometimes if you take the horizontal view and you you can see that hey, an FP four or uh, over an is gonna be better than an FP three because there's absolutely no lip support. And if we do a hybrid, we're not gonna get that lip support, and you're gonna invest all this money, and you're gonna still feel like you have that sunken face appearance because really no FP3 should have, you know, a labial flange. So that sounds expensive. <laughs> That's what, you know, typical dentist response. Um, and it is, you know, the prices, they've come down considerably, but, you know, CBCT, you're still looking at 60 to 90K. 
intraoral scanning, you still have 20 to 45 3D printers that you're going to use. I know there's some for a couple hundred bucks, but you know, with the dental applications, I think you're looking at more 2K to 10K. Uh, piezo motors are 6 to 12. You know, in camera setup, it's 2 to 6. Um, we have all these and we use these in everyday practice with or without implants, except maybe the piezo. Oh, yeah, with the piezo, with the endo. But I didn't acquire these all at once. I acquired as I grew. I started with the cone beam and the camera. I mean, the camera is a no brainer. I think that's something that if you don't have, everyone should get instantly. But the cone beam would follow shortly thereafter. Like I said, it, you diagnose more, you gain clinical confidence more, you find more, you treat more, you see more, all because of cone beams. So I'm a big proponent that you know, new patients should get one, almost every patient should have a scan. The radiation dose, I know a lot of principles. It's, it's a thing that I believe that you can rule out any underlying conditions that could be brewing. Um, but I grew, as I grew, as I gained confidence, as I went down the implant path, um, you know, I incorporated little by little. Plus, you know, finance with Henry Schein. I got all these through Henry Schein. It allowed me to grow with actually out having a pony up you know it became a monthly bill that i could afford because i'm doing more of these procedures that's generating more revenue that i can put more to my growth in the practice and then the implant kits are expensive but if you do a startup bundle they're typically thrown in and same with motors and hand pieces um you know that could be you know 10k plus that you're looking into that you buy the implants even some companies, um, you guys know, do strongly recommend if you're just starting, start with a local rep and a reputable company. I know you can get cheaper implants. I know titanium is just titanium, but you know, it's, I can't tell you the amount of times that I've had, you know, a major surgery and I'm missing a multi-unit for this, this size, or I get a spinner and I have to go size up and I don't have the right prosthetic component that, I have a rep that has his local connections that they can go and get the part and rush it over to me that same day. And I've had other doctors take some of my inventory because they were in the same bind. Uh, they'll help you place your first couple. They're, they'll let you borrow their kit and your know, motor sometimes. They, they want your business, but they want that relationship. So I still use a major name brand um, with my rep. Yeah, could I go direct and save you know, 100 bucks an implant? It's not worth that to me. Um, but it's, you invested all this money. You, you, like I said, that's you know quarter billion dollars in equipment, at least 200K that we talked about. You have to have systems and protocols and you have to have that established with your team. You can't just say, I bought this new toy, let's figure it out. You have to have and explain when we're going to use this, how we're going to use this, what to do, have training, have people invested in it. Otherwise, they're just going to be expensive dust collectors. Um, have systems for deployment. If it gets, oh man, I'm in the middle of this, that's, I'm going to have the D-glove unset up, especially with now all the PPE requirements. Have ways that it can be deployed fast and efficiently um you know rapid carts stuff like that when needed versus getting put away getting put it set up truly believe in that you can't just buy something and hope it will work um you know with anything we do but um and that, as we mentioned before it, these weren't just for implants i mean for me personally but i've gotten so much use in every other facet of dentistry so it will add to your complex tooth born dentistry if that's the route you do want to go so the ROI, uh, 2019, we placed 307 implants between two practices. Uh, we were on pace to do more, but obviously uh, we're all getting back to the swing of things. I'm not gonna do the obligatory COVID joke, but that was approximately 1.1 million in revenue just from implants when I bought the practice in 2017. 90% uh, of that was in my primary practice, maybe about 10% in the um, you know, startup practice. But when I bought this practice in 2017, it was $1.1 million in revenue total between hygiene. So that really allowed me to help you know, triple my practice in just a few years. Um, all the equipment, each, a lot of the big ticket items will be, have a useful life for about five years. 
I uh, had a mentor say that. So finance five years, um, but the cost of all the equipment, the implants, the lab fees, and the miscellaneous overhead for two practices, I could have paid off with just the 2019 revenue. So I would have had four years of additional revenue, plus all the implants would have been paid for. And then it would just would have been ongoing lab fees. Um, and I would still would have had a decent profit left over. So, and then obviously the usefulness and the other facets of general dentistry that we talked about with all that equipment, it would have just been, you know, icing on the cake. So, and there's also a personal ROI. You know, we were providing life-changing care to patients. We had patients with terminal dentition that had no confidence to smile, that, you know, that change their lives, change their outlooks, who eat, has the confidence to open their mouth. It's truly beyond rewarding. And I am doing more of the dentistry that I love. And a good thing, you get to get rid of those PETA patients and those procedures that you don't like to do. So how do I get implant patients? I don't have implant patients, but they are in your practice. A huge, a big step to do. It's if you're just, you don't do implants or you're deciding I'm on the fence, so I want to do implants. Look at your schedule the next couple of weeks, assuming that, you know, it's a full schedule and you're back up and operating, but count how many or have your hygienist or have your assistant or have someone just count how many denture spaces there are. You've heard of this before. I did this before I got started. Each one of those are potential implant fees and then times that by what you would charge. And that could be potential revenue that you're missing out on because you don't have the confidence or you don't have, they don't want to go to a specialist or, for whatever reason, that could be an implant patient in your practice. But, um, so you decide you wanna to market to implant patients, but do you have systems for set up for what a new patient calls? You know, what is the process in your office for them to get in? You know, when can you get them in? Do they know what the next opening is? Uh, do you offer consultations? Uh, phone training and screening. Does the team know how to kick, you know, just people, price shopping and are a waste of your time. You know, so many times I hear my front desk and you know, I'll walk there and they're, they're saying there's no opening for a while. I'm like, oh, there's one tomorrow. And then they give me the head shake. When they hang out, it's like, that's a patient you don't want. So it's, they know the patients and the type of dentistry want, we want to do. So do, are they on the same page? Um, you know, do they know the cost, the benefit, the steps? Not just your assistant, but the hygienist that the, they can explain to their recare. The front desk when they're on the phone um, all these people should be able to communicate the same thing and customer service is key um, i truly believe that we're beyond the point of being just you know we're co-mingled between healthcare provider and customer service focus um, we'll touch base on that shortly but and then finally you want to do implants you want to grow implants is are you marketing correctly you know is your back door closed are you have active recare do you have protocols to keep your existing patients while able to grow. Otherwise, those new patients are just gonna funnel throughout that back door. You know, what does your message say? You know, what is your website, your social media? You know, what, what does that say about you? What, does it say you do implants or are you still just family? Um, are you just, just a general practice that doesn't, you don't differentiate from anyone else on your street? Uh, reviews, that's bold. I think those are key. Um, that's been one of the biggest and easiest, most inexpensive way to market. Uh, just solid reviews, um, internal reviews, Google reviews. You, know, you go to a restaurant, your friend says, this is the best meal I've had in my life. The first thing you do is look at the website and you look at the reviews, without doubt. You know, word of mouth carries weight, but it's not the end all be all. And um, yeah, don't listen to that 19 year old entrepreneur that messages you on Facebook saying they're gonna get you a thousand new patients uh, via ClickFunnels. I think I've gotten you know, about two, three a day. So don't listen or spend your money on that. But do you have a way to make implant dentistry and complex dentistry affordable? They come in and it's $20,000, $30,000 case. Are you saying 15 you know, down, half down, half later? You know, can you fit it into a monthly budget? Um, are you using third party financing? And do you have an in-house membership plan? And I ask that because you put yourself in two scenarios. You put yourself in two camps. You're the patient that is self-employed, no group dental fit plan, only came in for emergencies. You never really felt like you had a dental home was always concerned about cost. Or someone that worked in corporate America with good plans that got routine care. Who do you think is gonna need more implant dentistry 
And who do you want to cater towards? I'd rather cater towards a person without dental insurance. You don't have to deal with insurance, but then they have a sense of, they belong to your practice. They're going to keep coming to your practice. And they've been showing to have the Amazon Prime model by spending three times more. So you're doing more complex care on people without insurance that were hesitant because they were always so price focused or didn't really feel like they had a dental home. So this is what we do in my practice. So everything we talked about, um, you know, what I do is we offer complimentary and I underlined and bolded that consultations in second opinions. It doesn't say free. Um, I, they mean the same thing, but it doesn't have that vernacular just doesn't, it just elevates it that it's not something that is not valuable. Um, I believe in my time, my team in a week and close, um, we have patients that keep coming in. We have second opinions from a lot of big name corporate all on four places that uh, we see and that we keep in our practice. So it's not that I devalue my time. It's more that I value the systems that we've created, the way that the front office looks, the way that my team's trained, the way that we talk and talk to patients. So that is more just a reaffirm of everything and all the effort that we put into. Uh, we do case fees for implants, overdentures, and hybrids. Again, I do a lot of the surgery and the, uh, and the prosthesis myself. So there's a lot less overhead. So our prices could be a little bit more on the aggressive side, not because we cut corners or take shortcuts, but it's because we know it's more based on my overhead, the time and the difficulty. So it's not based on this UCR number that really doesn't carry weight in cases like this. Um, we have a direct marketing message. Um, right here is a 16 page mini zine that we send out to the surrounding towns and we get patients driving 30, 25, 30 miles, passing you know, 50, 60 practices to come to us. It's informative, it's, it's getting the patients that we wanna see. There, there's no price special, there's no $59 or whitening special. Um, it's just not the practice that I'm trying to grow. Um, here we can see our reviews, uh, we're up to 346 reviews. Uh, a couple of two stars, everyone has a bad day. But every positive review, if you read those, they don't just talk about me. I think actually none just mentions me by name. Every single one, if you were to look, they mentioned my team. And I truly believe that is a huge game changer is having everyone on the same page, um, having everyone working together, having no specific roles. I don't feel like I'm above my team. Uh, none of my doctors that work with me feel like they're above, they all work together. Um, front desk, assistance, hygiene, that is crucial. Um, and you, it shows every patient. I mean, it'd be nice if they complimented my you know, class twos that I still do from time to time, but they don't. And we do these meetings and trainings every two to three weeks. Um, they, if they have something they want to learn more about, especially going into care that they're not used to seeing in previous work environments, uh, you know, more about the procedure, how to talk to patients. Every two to three weeks, we have a team meetings. We go through protocols, procedures. We're all on the same page, so really nothing gets fallen behind the crack. Uh, flexible but firm. You know, costs are come up up front. Um, we tell everyone what they're expected to pay. We give them flexible options, but they know there's no surprises. And if I state a fee, if there's a case fee, if I do more, I eat that. I think that's yeah. You know, we're not nickeling and diming patients. Um, you know, it's we're not charging PPE fees. But I mentioned the membership club. Uh, we have over 500 active patients on it. Um, they're all you know, self-paying patients. It's recurring revenue. Uh, we don't have contracts with PPOs. So we still take dental, Premier, and Blue Cross Blue Shield. But um, it allows us to kind of see less PPO dependent patients. And there's still room to grow and expand. Yeah, I'm still learning. I'm doing a bunch of courses this upcoming fall. Like I said, I'm still just scratch, scratching at the surface of what implants can do. Um, there's people well above me that I'm striving to be, but it's kind of, you know, sharing my journey to show that you can grow and implants can make a huge difference and it's definitely a ride worth driving. So um, here is you know, my contact info. And again, I want to thank you guys. Um, everyone's been <laughs> zoomed out. I've been zoomed out. You know, I racked up a couple hundred hours of CEs during this whole pandemic. But uh, if there's any questions we don't get to next, this is my email, this is my cell phone, uh, social media, please don't hesitate to reach out, ask questions, you know, trying to 
you know, this whole profession, you know, all rising tides, you know, float all ships. So it's something that I truly believe helping each other out. It's, you know, it's something to do for the profession. So now to questions. Cool. Well, thank you, Dr. Anise, for that great presentation. Before we do get to answering some questions, I did have a couple inquiries about the cost of CBCT, intraoral scanner, 3D printers. I know Dr. Anise shared a slide on that, but I do encourage those of you who asked to reach out to your Henry Schein rep or email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we'll put you in touch with the correct people. All right, on to the questions. The use of the surgical guide in implants, in your opinion, is it a must now? It's, it should be if you have the capabilities. I have I still place free hand. I think having confidence in the ability in placing free hand is crucial because a guide works until it doesn't. And then what are you doing in that case? Um, I think it should be in every clinical scenario, but like I said, I've placed hundreds without guides with no, but that should be not an anterior, not close to anatomy. Um, it should be whenever possible, but not, 100% absolutely recommended. I know some people say every time it should. Um, it should be tried and manufactured when possible, but like immediate placements, I don't think you really need a guide um, or having that skill set to when it doesn't work because they don't work all the time. And then a lot of people don't do, um, you know, they just do the tissue punch, but now you're re removing you know, a significant amount of keratinized tissue which has been shown to hold and maintain the long-term stability of that implant. Um, a lot more importantly now with the recent studies that are coming out. How many implant brands do you suggest dentists keep in stock? Do you only place one brand or do you- I have, two, I have two brands. Um, I don't think you should go beyond that. It's, you know, I have two different, I mean, I'm moving to just one, just to streamline, but you know, there's advances. Some implant lines come out that are great, that are phenomenal, that everyone tries to copy. Um, I don't think you should be switching all the time, but I think you should kind of keep it consistent between, you know, maybe two for different indications. You know, some are more aggressive cutting for more of an all in four procedure or has less, you know, prosthetic components that are easy to do with just, you know, single platform or sort of platform options. So you don't have all this different overhead for different size platforms. Um, and then there's everyday implants. So there's, I'd say right around two should be good, but if you're starting definitely one to start with. And I can't remember if you answered or spoke on this, but what was the first implant system you used and what do you currently use? So I learned on biohorizons when I was in Mexico. Um, I do majority of my systems are with biohorizons. I also do uh, neodent, um, you know, for some cases too. But, you know, I would say 80% Strawman, I mean, 80% BioHorizons. Um, you have a great local rep, and then about 20% new debt. Let's see. Would you recommend diving into more full arch cases or just keep, oops, where did it go? Or just keep on focusing on one to three implant cases? What's the, <laughs> so, what's the that, better return on investment and profit margin? Um, that's up to you. Uh, it's how fast and how proficient. In some days, I've had cases that go wrong. You're going to have cases that go wrong. I have cases I'm dealing with now that I wish I never did. Um, but then you do the case that goes perfectly um, with you know, full arch. And if you're fast and you're proficient, your full arch, you can definitely have a better profit margin. But it's, it's a lot. Your body's sore. Things are, you know, you're taken away, especially if you're going for an FP3. Um, I remember I had two doctors come watch me and we're doing some you know, good amount of maxillary reduction to hide the transition zone. And we hit the nasal palatine and, you know, that blood was spewing, you know, eight feet across the room and they both almost passed out. So those things happen when you get into more full arch and you have bone reduction, but you know, that's definitely planning. Um, if you're already doing one to three, it's, it's a good step. You can see if you want into it, even if it's just the placement, and then, you know, the hard part is having the lab conversion. You can always bring a lab tech with you and they can do the prosthetic because you're probably wiped after two, three hours, four hours of standing up doing the surgery. Do you now 
or if not, do you plan on doing soft tissue surgeries sometimes needed around implants? I do them now. I do. I mean, again, start of the foundation I was doing. Um, I do, you know, I don't do a whole quadrant or like pin drop, but I can do basic tunneling for treatment of mucosal defects. And, you know, if they need keratinized tissue because I don't have enough during placement, I can harvest from the palate. Yeah, I can do a sling procedure. I don't have to take the full keratinized tissue and tuck it in. So I do have experience with that. So I do do that, and I think it's important to have because we are showing that soft tissue is, is super vital for the long-term success of implants and the, maintaining the bone levels. Got a couple questions regarding sedation and implants. So the first one is, how important is sedation for the comfort of placing implants? And so all those cases, um, I got my IV certification two years ago at Duquesne. All those cases I've done have just been under local anesthesia because it's taken me about a year and a half to get my facility permit, um, which is another story in itself. Um, so I have the permit. I can do IV. I haven't even done it once. Um, we can just do, I mean, you can also just do like a single prescription of a benzo. Um, that usually works. I know here in Massachusetts, if you combine that with nitrous, then that becomes conscious. I had my permit for conscious, but not the facility permit for conscious. So yeah, I think it's something to strive for, even if you're not doing implants, you know, conscious sedation is gonna get you more complex care. I think it's something to definitely, if you're gonna add and build your practice, I went and invested, you know, a week in, you know, 10, 15 grand plus loss of production, but I haven't been able to utilize it. So. I say do it. I say definitely go for it to add. It's definitely something good to have. But like I said, I've done, you know, 30, 40 full hours just on the local. So. Okay. And about what percent of the implants that you place would you say use sedation? I like, I haven't, I just, without a typical like analgesic, that's, you know, at this point, ideally I'm moving more towards sedation. Um, but I just need to legally allow to do it. So at this point, it's zero uh, minus like a Versed or like a, not like a Benzo or Valium before the appointment just to calm them down. But it's still not OCS because I still need to get my facility permit. What brand motor and armamentarium for implant prep and placement do you recommend? So I, mine came with my um, surgical kit. It's a W&H. You know, good motor. Um, a motor is a motor. Um, armatarium, it's, you know, 15 blade, you know, periosteal. It's you know, things that you use in typical periodontal surgery. Um, you know, Minnesota retractor. It's basically kind of it. Um, it's, the motor isn't going to be too much. You know, the motors now are a lot more lightweight. You know, make sure you can control the water. Make sure you can control you know, reverse because, you know, with Versa burrs now, they run in reverse and they're, you know, osteodensifying your osteotomy, which is, you know, I just started using, which has been really great. How do we avoid liability if there's an abnormality on a scan we don't recognize? Does everything need to be sent to a maxillofacial radiologist or does the patient so, signing? The if you're going 11 by nine, I... A learn to read, it's beam readers, or if you're going to be sent out, charge the patient. Um, you know, if you keep it eight by eight and you don't go beyond the anatomy that you, you know, weren't familiar with in oral maxillofacial radiology class, where, you know, typically eight by eight, you're not going to get anywhere past, you know, anything that you haven't seen or been able to diagnose. If you do go 11 by nine and some of the bigger fields that you do need for these surgeries, it's 80 bucks to get read, uh, digitally read. You can charge the patient costs. You can charge them you know, double the amount. It's totally up to you. It just, there is, is liability. I, that's what everyone scares you. I haven't personally experienced that. But any case where I can't detect something or if I see something suspicious, I'll get it read. How do you set up payment options if patients have implant surgical placement done at an, by another doctor and will have prosthetics completed by a restorative dentist? I mean, that should be done if you're working in a relationship with a specialist. So there should be, they should understand, you should know their fee if that's something that should be continually going on. I don't know that because I'm doing the surgery, doing the prosthetics myself. 
Um, so I can't really speak too much, but if I were in that scenario, I should know their fee. They should know the total cost prosthetically and surgically. And there should be, okay, you know, typically prosthetics, you know, full arcs can be right around 15 grand or so. I mean, there should be ways that they can make it affordable in your office, whether third party financing or in-house financing. But that's something that, you know, should be laid out completely because the last thing you want is the patient to go to the surgeon and pay all that money for the surgery and then think that's inclusive of the prosthetics and they get mad at you. Is there a CBCT reader radiologist service that you would recommend? Uh, I use beam readers personally. Um, they're out, I think in Washington or uh, British Columbia. Uh, they're great. Um, I've had, a, they're recommended by, you know, dental town and Facebook groups. So I would say I've had no issues with them. They're relatively affordable. So, can you remind us on which 3D printer you currently have? I have the four blobs. Um, I used to live in Somerville, Mass, where their headquarters were. So, I'm pretty close to where they are. <clears throat> I know, I mean, there's so many coming to the market. Um, you know, Moonray, Sprint Ray, I've heard great things. Um, again, most, it depends what you're trying to do it for. Uh, the two different types between SLA and DLP. You know, the speed, the accuracy, what you're trying to accomplish, and what you're trying to get out of it. Um, that's, I think they're both great options. I've heard nothing but good things. And again, you may have touched on this, but how much do you charge for, uh, on average, for placing or restoring an implant? So my case fee, if you came in off the street, I'm in Massachusetts and the Northeast, so to preface, our fees are typically higher. Uh, before, if you were to go to you know, specialists and then a restorative dentist that could be northwards of five to six thousand dollars. Sometimes I've seen seven thousand. Um, my case fee, if you watch in no insurance, no anything, it's typically forty two hundred for placement. You know, if it's attraction, grafting, placing, abutment, and crown. So it's still a good profit margin, but it's typically lower than the fee. Again, we're not undercutting; it's just we're doing it all here. So, what percentage of time do you use a surgical guide for implants? I would say, I mean, 100% anterior. Um, I'm probably right around 60% or so, I would say. Again, moving more towards, we're getting systems. There was a time where I was trying to do all the surgery, but also trying to manage for full-time hygienists and rotating. But now I have an awesome team of associates that you know are kind of taking some basic routine dentistry um, and doing some of the routine um, hygiene visits and checkups and all that sort of thing so i can really focus and dial in um that's one blessing during this whole pandemic is we really focus on those systems and protocols and setups and really got the training on utilizing the technology <laughs> that we invested in all right and then we got time for one more question um when you uh, started your first practice did you know you wanted to place implants yeah I, as an associate i had um I had the skill set. I was doing it as an associate. You know, I probably had you know, maybe 50 to 100 over a, a year and a half, two years. So, and when I went to buy you know, something important, I found a service I could value at. You know, I saw the numbers. He did one or two implants. And I found out that it took him four hours on a Friday and everyone thought they were going to die. So I knew with my surgical skill set that that could be an instant value add to the patient population. So it was something that if you're in the buying process and you see that they don't and they refer that out, that could be a huge game changer and being able to pay for the practice now and being able to grow as in a practice in GP practice. Awesome. Well, that is all the time we have for today. So thank you, Dr. Anise, for your insightful presentation. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, and, if and you... No, I'll say any questions, don't hesitate to reach yep. out. I was going to say, if you have additional questions, please reach out to your Henry Schein rep. Feel free to email Dr. Anise or email us at webinars at henryshine.com and we'll get an answer back to you as soon as we can. Everyone attending today will receive a link to view the recording of the presentation in the coming week via email. And on behalf of Henry Schein, thanks again, Dr. Anise, and thanks everyone for attending. Have a great night.